chapter 10, comparing two populations or groups, and this is section 2, comparing two means. In this section, we'll describe the center shape and spread of the sampling distribution of the difference of two sample means, similar to the previous section, except now with means. We'll discuss whether the conditions are met for doing this inference. We'll talk about constructing and interpreting confidence intervals to compare the two means. We'll perform significance tests to compare the two means, and we'll determine when it's appropriate to do the two sample T procedures versus the paired T procedures. So what if we want to compare the mean of some quantitative variable for individuals in population one and population two? The parameters of interest are mu1 and mu2, and our best approach would be to take simple random samples from each population and compare those X bars. Suppose we want to compare the average effectiveness, for example, of two treatments in a completely randomized experiment. We use the mean response in the two groups to make the comparison. So group one has mu1 and mu and sorry, group one has mu1, x bar one, and n1, and then population two has the corresponding subscripts of two. To explore the sampling distribution of the difference between two means, let's start with two normally distributed populations where I know mu and I know sigma. For example, based on the information from the U.S. National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, the heights of a 10-inch girl follows a normal distribution with mean 56.4, standard deviation 2.7. 10-year-old boys have heights that follow a normal distribution with these parameters. So, suppose we take a simple random sample of 12 girls and an independent simple random sample of 8 boys and we measure their heights. Now, we would expect the 12 girls to have an X-bar that's kind of close to 56.4. And if all of our friends took samples of different girls, they would get different X-bars but all of them are kind of kind of going to bounce around 56.4 because that's the true average height of a 10-year-old girl. Likewise, we can do this with the 10-year-old boys. What can we say about the average difference or the difference in these average heights for the samples of boys and girls? So as before, we've used Fathom software to show this. This is a distribution of the heights of females. This is the distribution of heights of males. This one is a little bit skinnier for a couple of reasons. One, because the spread of the girls is smaller. Uh, that's, really, that's really what we're looking for. The boys have a bigger standard deviation. And as we take those numbers and we divide this by the square root of n, this sample size was bigger. So that also squeezes it in. The mean here is 56.4 with a standard deviation of 0.8. The mean here is 55.73 with a standard deviation of 1.35. And you can kind of see how these are close to what we have here with a smaller standard deviation because this is a sampling distribution. Now, every time I do that, if I subtract these two numbers that I get, I get a different distribution. And it looks like this, where the center of this distribution is 0.67, and the standard deviation is 1.56. Again, this is like me looking at 12, the heights of 12 10-year-old girls, and I put one dot on here. And then I take eight 10-year-old boys, measure their height, get an X bar, and I have one dot on here. When I subtract those two numbers, I get one dot on this graph. And then I repeat it over and over and over. It says they did it a thousand times. What do you notice about the center shape and spread of this? Both X bar 1 and X bar 2 are random variables. The statistic of X bar 1 minus X bar 2 is the difference in these. And in chapter 6, we talk about combining standard deviations uh, to find the standard deviation, we would combine the variances, even when that was a minus. So here's how that looks here. The shape, when distributions, when the populations are approximately normal, the sampling distribution will be approximately normal. 
If I don't start with normal distributions, this works if I have big sample sizes. The center of the distribution is going to be the difference in my two means, and the standard deviation of the sampling distribution is going to be found with this formula, combining the variances, provided that each sample is no more than 10% of the population. So in other words, I end up with a normal distribution. My x bar 1 minus x bar 2s fall somewhere along this axis, falling into a shape of a normal distribution, centered at mu1 minus mu2, with a standard deviation found by the square root of sigma1 squared over n1 plus sigma2 squared over n2. So here's a formula talking about the 10% rule here. The center being mu1 minus mu2 is our best guess. And if the normal condition is met, we standardize the observed difference to obtain a t-statistic that tells us how far the observed difference is from the mean in standardized units. So here's what that means. Since in real life I don't know the true standard deviations, I can use S's to determine the standard error. So I've replaced sigma here with S's. This gives me a formula for the t-test statistic. This is the statistic minus the parameter divided by the standard error of the statistic. This is approximately a t-distribution with degrees of freedom either matched by what your calculator would tell you, which is obtained with a complex formula that you don't need to know, or you can use the conservative approach, taking the smaller of these two sample sizes and subtracting one and using that for the degrees of freedom. Generally, both methods are going to give uh, comparable answers. The conservative approach makes it a little bit more difficult to uh, reject HO or it makes that confidence interval perhaps a little bit wider than the more accurate one you would get from technology. Here's a listing of the conditions again for the for the t-distribution. We've got the 10% rule we need to check. We need independent random samples. And if I have large sample sizes or I know the populations are normal, I'm good. Otherwise, we revert back to the small, medium, and large ideas that we had before. Uh, and we're concerned, of course, if there's some strong skewness or strong outliers in my samples. Confidence intervals are found similarly. X bar 1 minus X bar 2 is the statistic, plus or minus a critical value. It's a T star critical value. And then the standard error of the estimate right here. I can use my T star from the, from the calculator or from some sort of technology, or I could use the conservative degrees of freedom and use my chart. Significance test for mu1 minus mu2, it says the observed difference between two sample means can reflect an actual difference, or maybe we just got lucky. Significance tests help us decide which explanation makes more sense. So my null hypothesis is that mu1 minus mu2 equals something. In this course, it will be equal zero, meaning they're equivalent to each other. Or put a different way, the null hypothesis is that mu1 equals mu2. The alternative hypothesis could be the one-sided, greater than or less than case, or the two-sided, not equal to case. To do a test, standardize x bar 1 minus x bar 2, get my test statistic, use the degrees of freedom, and find the p-value. p-value represents the corresponding shaded blue region, and if that's really small, the p is low, I'm going to reject HO. When I plan a two-sample study, choose equal sample sizes if you can. When you're planning, if you've already got the answers, go with them will be okay. Do not use pooled two sample T procedures. I'm not going to go into why. There are cases that, that would be covered in a later course that could talk about that, but we don't need to do this now, primarily because we have good technology that will uh, handle it for us. We're safe using two sample T procedures when comparing for two means in a randomized experiment. 
We don't use two sample T procedures on paired data. If the data is paired, then my two samples are not independent. If my samples are paired, then they're not independent. So I don't do two sample procedures. Beware of making inferences in the absence of randomization. Remember, if we don't randomize, we don't know that our results are generally applicable to the larger population. In this section, I covered some theory behind the, the center shape and spread of a sampling distribution for the difference of two means. I talked about the conditions and how those apply here. We talked about confidence intervals and significance tests. And uh, we discussed the fact that paired T procedures don't have independent samples, so I would not use a two sample procedure, but rather a one sample procedure on the differences. Now you should go through some problems to see how these actually apply to real-world examples.